Hello and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker. I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. And today we look at The Way to Love, Meditations for Life by Antonio Di Mello. Recall the kind of feeling you have when someone praises you, when you are approved, accepted, applauded. And then contrast that with the kind of feeling that arises within you when you look at the sunset, or the sunrise, or nature in general, or when you read a book, or when you watch a movie that you thoroughly enjoy. Get the taste of this feeling, and then contrast it with the first feeling, namely the one generated within you when you were praised. Understand that the first type of a feeling comes from self-glorification, self-promotion, It is a worldly feeling. The second comes from self-fulfillment, a soul feeling. Having done this, attempt to understand the true nature of worldly feelings, namely the feelings of self-promotion, self-glorification. They're not natural. They were invented by your society and your culture to make you productive and to make you controllable. These feelings do not produce the nourishment and happiness that is produced when one contemplates nature or enjoys the company of one's friends or one's work. They were meant to produce thrills, excitement, and emptiness. Observe yourself in the course of a day or a week and think how many actions of yours are performed, how many activities engaged in that are uncontaminated by the desire for these thrills, these excitements that only produce emptiness, the desire for attention, for approval, for fame, for popularity, for success, or even power. Do you know what causes unhappiness? You will probably say loneliness or oppression, or war, or hatred, or atheism, and you will be wrong. There is only one cause of unhappiness. The false beliefs you have in your head, beliefs so widespread, so commonly held, that it never occurs to you to question them. The reason why you are unhappy is because you are focusing on what you do not have, rather than on what you do have right now. What makes you happy or unhappy is not the world or the people around you, but the thinking in your head. So spend some time seeing each of the things you cling to for what it really is, a nightmare that causes you excitement and pleasure on one hand, but also worry insecurity, tension, anxiety, fear, unhappiness on the other. Every single thing you cling to and have convinced yourself you cannot be happy without. Nightmare. Who's responsible for this programming? Not you. It isn't really you who decided even such basics as your wants and your desires and so-called needs, your values, your tastes, your attitudes. It was your parents, your society, your culture, your religion, your past experiences who fed the operating instructions into your computer. Now, however old you are, or wherever you go, your computer goes along with you and is active and it's operating at each conscious moment of the day, imperiously insisting that its demands be met by life, be met by people, and be met by you. If the demands are met, the computer allows you 
to be peaceful and be happy if they're not met, even though it be through no fault of yours, the computer generates negative emotions that cause you to suffer. It is from the oppression of your programming that you need to be liberated. Only then will you experience that inner freedom from which alone all social revolution must arise. For the powerful emotion, the passion that arises in your heart at the sight of social evils and impels you to action will have its origin in reality, not in your programming or your ego. Almost every negative emotion you experience is a direct outcome of an attachment. So there you are, loaded down by your attachments and striving desperately to attain happiness precisely by holding on to the load. The very notion is absurd. Hardly anyone has been told the following truth. In order to be genuinely happy, there is one and only one thing you need to do. Get deprogrammed. Get rid of those attachments. An attachment isn't a fact. It is a belief. It is a fantasy in your head acquired through programming. Now, the tragedy of an attachment is that if its object is not attained, it causes unhappiness. But if it is attained, it does not cause happiness. It merely causes a flash of pleasure followed by weariness. And it is always accompanied, of course, by the anxiety that you might lose the object of your attachment. Who decides what finally makes its way to your conscious mind from all the material that is pouring in from the world? Three decisive filters. First, your attachments. Second, your beliefs. And third, your fears. The first truth, you must choose between your attachments and happiness. You cannot have both. The second truth, where did your attachments come from? You were not born with them. They sprang from a lie that your society and your culture have told you, or a lie that you have told yourself, namely, that without this or the other. Without this person or the other, you cannot be happy. Just open your eyes and see how false this is. The third truth. If you wish to be fully alive, you must develop a sense of perspective. Life is infinitely greater than this trifle your heart is attached to and which you have given the power to so upset you. And so the fourth truth brings you to the unavoidable conclusion that no thing or a person outside of you has the power to make you happy or unhappy. Whether you are aware of it or not, it is you and only you who decides to be happy or unhappy. Whether you will cling to your attachment or not in any given situation. Do you see how you are in a prison created by the beliefs and traditions of your society and your culture and by the ideas, prejudices, attachments, fears of your past experiences? Wall upon wall surrounding your prison cell so that it seems almost impossible that you will ever break out and make contact with the richness of life and love and freedom that lies beyond your prison fortress. And yet, the task, far from being impossible, is actually easy and delightful. What can you do to break out? First thing, realize that you are surrounded by prison walls, that your mind has gone to sleep. It does not even occur to most people to see this. So they live and die as prison inmates. 
most people end up being conformists. They adopt to prison life. You can only be a revolutionary when you see the prison walls in the first place. Second, contemplate the walls. Spend hours just observing your ideas, your habits, your attachments, and your fears without any judgment and condemnation. Look at them and they will crumble. Third, spend some time observing the things and people around you. Look, but really look, as if for the very first time at the face of a friend, a leaf, a tree, a bird in flight. The behavior and mannerism of the people around you. Really see them and hopefully you will see them afresh as they are in themselves without the dulling, stupefying effects of your ideas and your habits. The fourth and the most important step, sit down quietly and observe how your mind functions. There's a steady flow of thoughts and feelings and reactions there. Watch the whole of it for long stretches of time, the way you watch a river or a movie. You will soon find it so much more absorbing than any river or a movie and so much more life-giving and liberating. After all, can you even say to be alive if you're not even conscious of your thoughts and your reactions? The unaware life it is said is not worth living. It cannot even be called life. It is a mechanical robot existence, a sleep, an unconsciousness, a death. And yet this is what people call human life. Understand your pride and it will drop. What results will be humility. Understand your fears and they will melt. The resulting state is love. Understand your attachments and they will vanish. The consequence is freedom. Love and freedom and happiness are not things that you can cultivate and produce. You cannot even know what they are. All you can do is observe their opposites and through your observation cause these opposites to die in a conflict between nature and your brain. Back nature if you fight her, she will eventually destroy you. The secret, therefore, is to improve on nature, in harmony with nature. You will fear to make mistakes, to be yourself, to do or say anything that will spoil this image. You have lost the freedom to make a fool of yourself, to be laughed at and to be ridiculed, to do and say whatever feels right to you, rather than what fits in with the image others have of you. How does one break this? Through many patient hours of study, of awareness, observation of what the silly image brings you. It gives you a thrill combined with so much insecurity and unfreedom and suffering. If you were to see this clearly, you will lose your appetite to be special to anyone, to be highly regarded by anyone. You would move about with sinners or bad characters and do and say as you please, regardless of what people think of you. You would become like the birds and flowers that are so totally unselfconscious, too busy with the task of living to care one little bit about what others think of them, about whether they're special to others or not. And at last, you will have become fearless and free. Once you begin to see, your sensitivity will drive you to the awareness, not just of the things you choose to see, but of everything else as well. Your poor ego will try desperately to blunt that sensitivity because its defenses are being stripped away and it is left with no protection and nothing to cling to. If you ever allow yourself to see it will be the death of you. And that is why love is so terrifying. For to love is to see, and to see is to die. But it is also the most delightful, exhilarating experience in the whole world. 
if you wish to break out of the cycle and into the world of love, you must strike while the attachment is alive and well, not when you have outgrown it. And you must strike not with the sword of renunciation, for that kind of mutilation only hardens it, but with the sword of awareness. What must you be aware of? Three things. First, you must see that the suffering that this drug is causing you, the ups and downs, the trills, the anxieties and disappointments, the boredom to which it must inevitably lead. Second, you must realize what this drug is cheating you out of, namely the freedom to love and to enjoy every minute of everything in life. And third, you must understand how, because of your addiction and your programming, you have invested the object of your attachment with the beauty and the value it simply does not have. What you are so enamored of is in your head, not in your beloved person or in a thing. See this, and the sword of awareness breaks the spell. See with unflinching clarity the simple and shattering truth contrary to what your culture and religion have thought you. Nothing, but absolutely nothing, can make you happy. The moment you see that, you will stop moving from one job to another, one friend to another, one place to another, one spiritual technique, one guru to another. None of these things can give you a single minute of happiness. They can offer you a temporary thrill, a pleasure that initially grows in intensity, but then turns into pain if you lose them, and into boredom if you keep them. If you search within your heart, you will find something there that will make it possible for you to understand a spark of disenchantment and discontent, which is fanned into a flame which will become a raging forest fire that will burn up the whole of the illusory world you are living in thereby unveiling to your wondering eyes the kingdom that you have always lived in unsuspectingly. How many people do you know whose thinking is at least sometimes opposed to their self-interest? How many times can you recall having engaged in that kind of thinking yourself? How often have you succeeded in placing an impenetrable barrier between the thinking going on in your head and the fears and desires that agitate your heart. Each time you attempt that task, you will understand that what clear thinking calls for is not intelligence that is easily come by, but the courage that has successfully coped with fear and with desire. For the moment you desire something or fear something, your heart will consciously or unconsciously get in the way of your thinking. Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read. Never stop learning. Thank you. Love and respect.